Good morning, Open Bible family. Isn't that a blessing to see? Uh, being involved in our community, we had several souls saved to Christ, and I think next week or the following week, actually one of them is going to be getting baptized. So it's nice to see the candy. It's nice to see people on campus. It's also a tremendous seeing God's fruits of the labor being done here with souls won to Christ. If that gets you excited this morning, can I hear an amen? amen. All right, we've got a f- couple quick announcements here. Uh, we have our midweek service, just to touch note on that. If you guys have time on a Wednesday, and listen, week gets busy and we get tied up into things, but it's an hour service, so it's not a lot of your time. Pastor's always prompt. He's got a big giant clock in the back. He watches, and we are out every Wednesday at 8 o'clock. But if you're looking for a place for your children, if you just need to get away from the things of the world and get into God's Word and uh, get one-on-one with our pastor, and it's a much more relaxed setting, make time on Wednesday nights. That starts at 7 o'clock. We'd love to have you out. We also get excited about our guests, and I see several new faces out there. If you can take in front of you, there's a Connect card. It's a little green thing in front there. If you can fill that out, put a brief amount of information out there, would be a great help to us. In the back at our welcome desk, there is a gift for you back there, just a little sign of appreciation for you visiting with us. Uh, We also have a little bit of business this morning. Where is Bob Smith at? All right, Bob, this week, or last week, was it Thursday? 81 years old, young. So can we give him a round of applause for Bob Smith, 81 years old. We, uh, we love him. A tremendous example here at Open Bible. Uh, just a tremendous example to me personally. I just really appreciate Bob and the many years of God's work here in service. And uh, we're thankful that he has turned 81. We look forward to maybe 91, 101. Bob, you're not going to go there anytime soon, my friend. We have a wonderful service here for you today. Uh, Pastor is starting a new sermon on family. Uh, Ironically, in my own class, not to give a little uh, kick out there for the connect groups, uh, I am actually doing the same thing. I'm making homework. Uh, If there's anything, if you watch TV this week or anything going on, it doesn't take long to see Satan's attack on the family. Look, God instituted that back in Genesis 2 with the family Satan, for thousands of years, has continued to attack that, and he's doing that today. So if there's anything we need is strong Christian family units for God's service, so we're excited about what that message pastor has for us. Uh, We're going to go to a word of prayer, and after I pray, our choir is going to be singing Angagas Day, and we're looking forward to that. Let's go to God's word as we start our service off. Heavenly Father, we are blessed. Thank you for this first quarter here at Open Bible. We're excited to see the many souls that have been won to Christ. We pray, Father, that as souls are won, we would be doing a good job of mentoring. We pray for your continued blessings. We pray as we are in your service today that all is said, preached, and sung would glorify you. Work on our hearts in Christ's name. Amen.
stand as we go and praise music. We're going to be singing Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. Reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow. Defender of the weak, you comfort those in need, you lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we'll wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. God, you do not think you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like Continue singing with leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting singing with Jesus Messiah. He became sin who 
Wonderful. Thank you, Austin family. Thank you, Carrie and Tyler, for doing such a great job raising your children and setting an example for families here at our church. Let me clean up the table a little bit. People leave me all kinds of things up here. Tyler, help me if you would, please. Uh, you can give that to me at the end of the service, all right? Unless you want me to sing this. No, I don't think so. All right. He said, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Good, every, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. You have your Bibles with you. Uh, join, join me in the book of Genesis, chapter 27. And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to begin um, uh, uh, called a mini series. It's going to be just about four or five weeks, and uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the family uh, for the next several weeks. And uh, whether you whether you are raising children or not, I'm sure. God's word will speak to you and be a blessing to you. And you know, even if we're past raising our children, we can still help uh, others who are raising theirs, correct? And body of Christ here. And we like to be a blessing to, uh, you know, those that are younger families and doing such a great job in raising their children. And God's blessed OB with some great families, some great young families. And, uh, and I love being around their children. Wednesday night, I I uh, took off from teaching Bible study here in the auditorium, and I went and visited with the master clubs and the team ministry and our grief share, and boy, I had, I had a great time. And it's just always neat. Uh, I, I popped into one class. I think it was, I'm not sure what class Will and Carrie teach um, on Wednesday night master club, but I popped into that class, and Carrie's eyes brightened up. She says, Pastor, she said, we're just praying for you, and we're going we're gonna to draw pictures of you. <laughs> and... Uh, 
And so I, I said to the young people, I said, please be kind, you know. <laughs> the older you get, you know, things start to change. And they're not where they used to be, right? You ever wake up in the morning and what you went to bed with is someplace else? And I'm not talking about your spouse? <laughs> Amen? You'll get that when you, you know, kind of later on. But look at, look at the screen here uh, with me for a moment. Family. Family. What, what do you think about? So what do you think about when, when you think about family? What, what do you think about? I think, I think for some, I'm not, I'm, I was theoretical. That was just, just something you think about. I think, I think for some, uh, family is everything. It's everything, right? Uh, our faith you know, our faith is paramount. Our faith is foundational, correct? I mean, everything, you know, once you come to know Christ as Savior, your faith in the Lord is what guides you through life. It guides us through life. So, so our faith is paramount, correct? Good to see you, Michelle. So glad you're back in town. We'll miss you. Um, our faith, then I think many of us would say our faith and then our, you know, our, our family. And I'm not sure, honestly, if we could really separate the two and how, how you would kind of layer them because they kind of, right? You know, it's almost kind of like having a priority list, you know, as a Christian. You say, well, top priority is God, then comes family, then comes church, then comes service, then comes work, and then comes, you know, and, and I guess that's okay. But if you think about it, sometimes we might say this, okay, so God's my priority. First thing in the morning, let me check the God thing off and then let me check the family. But it, do, it do, doesn't work that way because we need God all day long in everything that we do, whether it's family life or work life or school or social or whatever it might be, right? You know, but we would say, I think we would say that uh, if we're talking about things that we value, things that matter to us, for many of us, we would say family, you know, right below our faith in God and our relationship with God, family means everything. I know this, I know because I, I live and breathe and, and have been in church for a long time, I know when you speak about family, at times it stirs up some difficult emotions, right? Let me say this and mark it down, there are absolutely, positively no perfect families. You might think, man, look at the Austin family up here, these kids, they, they got problems. I don't mean that to be negative, but... How many teenagers you got in your house right now? Three. We need to pray for Tyler and Carrie. Three teenagers at the same time. Did we have three at the same time? We did. You know, that's why I lost hair. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's challenging. So, but there's no, there's no perfect families. Every family has something, right? When you live in Christ, when you live for Christ, when you allow Christ to live in and through you, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. It makes the challenges uh, manageable, you know? It makes the difficulties less difficult. Not that you're not gonna have challenges. It's not that you're not gonna have difficulty, because you will. Christians suffer. That's just part of life, correct? You don't get saved to eliminate suffering. In fact, mm, usually when you get saved, you get a little bit more. Isn't that right? You get banged from areas you never get banged from before. You know, however, you have Jesus who is a constant, he's a constant presence in our lives, about our lives, that helps us through all of that. Correct? So, when you think about family, and again, I'm, I'm laying the foundation for the next few weeks, okay? When you think about family, uh, sometimes we, you know, we live in a society that likes to put labels on things. Isn't that right? And I think this, I think, and this is not new to us, but it is new to us, um, this is a new term, not new to us today, but it's kind of new to the American family. We've labeled the family today, the family unit today, in many cases, as being dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. Huh? Right? Uh, what, is, what does that mean? What does dysfunctional uh, mean? Well, the prefix D-Y-S or dis uh, denotes something that's abnormal, something that is faulty, something that is not functioning properly. And so we've put this label upon the family today. Uh, most families today, a lot of families today, several families today would be labeled as being dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. In fact, when I first heard this term, I, I'm not sure when that was, maybe in the 80s, 90s, I'm not sure. It, all, it, it dawned on me, you know what? I grew up in a dysfunctional family. 
And guess what? I, I'm, I'm dysfunctional. You know, every once in a while, you, you know. Uh, and and, and now, now pay attention to this for a second. Uh, dysfunctional. It's not, that, it's not that we would say the family's not functioning. That would be non-functional. No, the family is functioning. It's just not functioning properly. It's not behaving properly. There, there's, there's some faulty behaviors going on in the family today. And, 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 and this is important because I think this is what it comes down to is, is this. When we, begin to, um, when we begin to operate in a dysfunctional way, it causes, it has a cause effect on others. It has a cause effect on others. And I'm going to show you that as we go through our, our message uh, this morning. And so here's what's happened now. Pay attention here. Here's what's happened over the, over the past few years. Uh, and I kind of lose track of time. But the family being labeled as dysfunctional. Uh, by the way, we're going to go through dysfunctional and then functional and then nuclear. Do you hear the nuclear family? Uh, but what we want to be, what we want to produce, what we want to have is a biblical family. That's the best kind of family. A biblical family. Right, and we can all have that if that's our desire. Uh, but, but let me get through some of these uh, early lessons first, okay? Uh, and so today, here's what we've heard: uh, family is dysfunctional, and, and 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 it picks up terminology. Uh, some houses, some homes are labeled as. You, you, you've heard this before. This happened back uh, some time ago, where now homes are called. Uh, we have we have the latchkey kids, right? You're familiar with that. That we've heard that before, right? And that's where, you know what that is? How many, how many, no idea what that means, latchkey kids. No idea at all. That's when children come home from school and mom and dad are both working, right? And so they're latchkey kids. They have their own key. They get their own self in the house. They come home. There's nobody there to guide them and direct them and so on and so forth. That's the society we live in. Uh, the world in which we live in, there's a lot of times mom and dad both must work to make ends meet. By the way, I'm not being judgmental. I'm just stating some facts. Okay, stay with me. Uh, then you have single parent homes, right? I think you get the gist of that, right? There's a, either a father or a mother, but there's not uh, what we would call a traditional family unit with a father and a mother. And then, and then you have, uh, you have, oh, pay attention to this one. You have children controlled homes. Yeah. Children controlled homes. Go ahead. Yeah. Children controlled homes. Go ahead. Yeah. And that what that means? That means a lot of things. A, that means our schedule revolves around our children's schedule. So if they got a soccer game at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, guess where we're going? I know it's going to get quiet for a little bit, but this is what's happened in our society, right? We're being controlled by things God never meant for us to be controlled by. And there's times when our homes are controlled by our kids. Huh? And then, then you have addicted homes. Right? Where somebody is addicted to something inside the home, whether it's a drug, alcohol, uh, who knows? It could be all kinds of things. We have addicted homes that our kids, our kids are uh, growing up in. And then we have, pay attention right here, we have non-traditional homes. We have non-traditional homes. Uh, Brother Fenton alluded to this. He's teaching a course, uh, one of our Connect classes. And we're going to talk about our Connect classes at the very end of the service this morning, just to give you a brief on that. But he's doing one called, uh, what is it? Making home work, right? And, and I'm, I, I think part of that will, he, he'll, he'll probably, part of that class will be sharing, yes, the attack upon the modern day family, the attack, but, but it's not a new attack. There has been an attack on the family from the very first family. And we'll show you that here in just a moment. But today, I mean, I mean, the energy is, is, is just, it's vamped up, isn't it? I mean, the attack is coming from every angles, and man, it, it just, I'm, I'm really, Mrs. Genizzi and I, we have grandchildren, and it's, it's tough watching our children raise our grandchildren because of the day and age in which we live. You know, when my children were young, I think Amanda, maybe Amanda, I forget exactly when it was, but she was the only one that really had the opportunity to get a cell phone because prior to that, there were no cell phones. You know how boys and girls used to talk? When my daughter Nicole is our, our oldest, uh, she's, she's 72 now, Nicole. <laughs> she's grown so fast, she's older than we are. Uh, but when she, was, when, she was gone, when she was going to high school, when she was in fifth, you know, 15, 16 years old, you know how she used to talk to boys? They used to pass these little notes. 
Huh? And I thought back then, this is the end of the world. Man, this boy wrote my little, my daughter a note. I love you. You're going to be my wife. I think the world of you. Let's run away and elope. Don't tell your dad. He doesn't need to know this. And this is, this is a kid in my school, you know. And I'd find these notes in my daughter's school bag, and I'd go ballistic. I mean, I'd get the note, rip it up in a thousand pieces, blow it into the air. That's where that relationship is going. I mean, I was a lunatic. Now, with cell phones and tablets and every other means with social media and good grief couldn't even get that out what a challenge what a challenge and then our young people are you know we are inundated yes yes we're inundated through every medium whether it's radio tv print with the non-traditional Surge. I mean, they make funny sitcoms about two dads or two moms raising children. And so what happens is now our children, if not careful, are going to grow up thinking that's normal. What's wrong with that? But it's not normal. It's not normal. It's not normal. It's not normal. But that's the non-traditional home. And so, yes, I guess when you look at latchkey kids, single-parent homes, children-controlled homes, addicted homes, non-traditional homes, you get the idea. Dysfunctional. The family is not operating properly. They're not behaving. There's abnormalities in the home today. Are you with me? And that's what I want to deal with uh, this morning. I want, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about these dysfunctional families and I want you to see that even though I know we probably would say, once we found this out, well, man, I didn't realize how many dysfunctional families there are, this is not new to the American culture. In fact, when you, when you study the scriptures, you can trace dysfunctional families way back to the beginning. You know who the first family in history was? What was the first family in history? The Adams family. Right? Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Come on, you, you get so spiritual when you come to church. Huh? The Adams family. Now, now think about it, just for a second. I, I don't have time to pause on this, but think about it. In that family alone, in that family alone, the wife got out of her lane. You can say amen anytime you like. The wife, Eve, got out of her lane. She started, right? She got, I mean, and then Adam, when he's confronted, you know what he does? He throws his wife under the bus. Hey, it was the woman you gave me. It was all her fault. Right? Uh, their children, think about this. Their, their sons, one son kills his brother. But that's a great, that's a great family. As a, no, they're dysfunctional. And then, then just go on, go on through history. You go back to Noah. So you get out, you look at Noah. Won't get into the details, but Noah... Did you, did you know that one night Noah got drunk? And his sons came along and uncovered his drunkenness. And, and, and man, I, that's dysfunctional. Huh? Uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. You think about, uh, think about Abraham and Sarah. Huh? I mean, Abraham had his problems, didn't he? Uh, Sarah's wife. Let's not get into that whole debacle. Right? Uh, think, about, think about David. What does David do? David commits adultery, has a child, uh, dysfunctional. Think about Solomon. He might be the worst. 700 wives. What was the dude thinking? Huh? Good grief. I love my wife dearly, but one's enough. She's the best one. 700? That's got to be labeled as super dysfunctional. Amen. But the one I want, I, I want to highlight, the one I want to look at, it's a case study. I think it's the best case study on a dysfunctional family is the family of Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca. Uh, they're the parents of Jacob and Esau, the twins, right? You've heard of Isaac, of patriarch Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Uh, and so, um, and if, if, you talk about, if you talk about a dysfunctional family, in this case, and pay attention right here, it began in the womb. Because Rebecca is, uh, uh, she's with child, in fact, she's with twins, 
And at birth, at birth, the younger grabs hold of the heel of the elder. And I mean to tell you, it started right there at birth. Right there at birth. And uh, when you turn to our text, you see now the boys have grown up. Genesis 25 is where you'll find their birth. Genesis 27, they're grown up. And that's where I want to jump into this family debacle. Isaac is old and he's ready to die. And what happens in this text is a model of total dysfunction. And I want to go slow. And so if I don't get my whole message done this morning, I don't want you to miss any of this. All right. I, I'll pause it. I want to say things slow and say them again and repeat them because this is the foundation of dysfunction, of abnormal, faulty, living, thinking, reasoning begins right here in this text. And I hope I get your attention and I want you to get what we're going to talk about here in a mess. All four characters, it's Isaac, Jacob, uh, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and the, all four characters of this family prove to be a mess and a part of a mess. Huh? And, and it, begins, it begins with Isaac. You know, everything when it comes to God's economy begins with headship. Say with me, everything begins with headship, headship. Who is the head of the church? Jesus is the head of the church, right? Everything begins with headship. When you come to the family, the family unit, according to the Bible, according to God, headship is who? The father. Father's the head of the church, uh, the head of the family, right? Jesus, of course, head of the church, father, head of the family, headship. So let's begin with Isaac. Look at chapter 27, verse number one. It came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son. So you have Esau and Jacob, right? They're twins. Esau's the firstborn, not by much, but he's firstborn. And here's what he does. He says unto him, he says, son, uh, and of course Esau said, yeah, yes, dad, what, what is it? Here I am. And he said, behold, uh, I'm old and I, I don't know the day of my death. I know it's drawing soon. I know that's not written there, but I just wanted to add that. He says, go ahead and, 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 uh, and take thy weapons, thy quiver, thy bow. Go out uh, into the field and, and get some venison. Now, by the way, look here. Don't forget, you don't just go out to the field and buy venison in the wilderness. No, take your bow, take your arrow and go kill a deer. Right? That takes a little bit of time. Even some of you great white hunters, it takes a little bit of time to find the right deer to shoot. And then, of course, to, to shoot them, to hit them, to kill them, and then butcher them. Right? But I think sometimes we read the story and it's almost like he went to the, you know, he went to the shop right out in the wilderness and bought some venison. You know? No, he had to go out and hunt for this thing. And then he says, verse 4, he says, so go get some venison and then make me some of that, make me some of that that meat, man, some of that jerky. He doesn't say that, but savory meat. You know, get that venison. Do you ever have, do you ever have venison jerky? Oh, deer jerky? Oh, it's delicious, man. It's awesome stuff. You probably don't even like beef jerky, but it's pretty good stuff. Uh, and so he says, go ahead and make me some of that savory meat. You know that I love. Bring it to me that I may eat it. And now look at this. Pay attention right here. That my soul may bless thee before I die. Don't lose, don't, don't lose that. Jacob now, he, uh, Isaac now, he's in his latter stages. Uh, he's so old, he's so feeble, he can't even see. He calls his older, his eldest son, the firstborn in. He says to him, I'm getting ready to, to take my flight to heaven. But before I go, man, I love, to, I love to get some of that, some of that savory meat, some of that venison that you make. You know, would you go out, into the, go out into the forest, go out into the wilderness, go get yourself a deer, make me some of that, and then come on back, back, back in, fix it for me, I'll eat it, and then I will place the blessing, the family blessing upon you. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? And I would say, everything. Everything. And let me share with you uh, why. Uh, at the core... At the core, and, I, and go, go ahead, back, go back uh, to that slide, if you will. At the core, I wrote down this. What you see there in verse number one is a father's rebellion. Talking about dysfunctional families. Everything rises and falls upon 
headship. The father is the head of the family. And so this family's dysfunction began with the dad, Isaac. Isaac. And let me, just, let me just mention something. I'll elaborate on that in a moment. But let me mention something to you about rebellious people. Are you paying good attention? Wave at me. I'm here, Pastor. I'm here. Listen to this. Rebellious people. At the core of a rebellious person is this. It's, the, it's being self-centered. And so rebellious people are self-centered people. Right? How many would say, preacher, I understand what a self-centered person... I know what it means to be self-centered. Just, yeah, yes? Do I need to elaborate on it? In, in essence, the world revolves around you. It's all about me. It's all about me. Right? Isn't that, isn't that the world we live in today? Isn't that our society today? Haven't we been told that today? Haven't it been, it's been drilled into our kids today? It's all about me. It's all about me. I mean, there's logos, there's uh, company mantras, there's uh, commercials. It's all about you. Uh, I remember back in the day when I was growing up, McDonald's, you deserve a break today. So get up and get away at McDonald's. And remember you had the guy with the broom, you deserve a break today, so get up and get away. You remember that? See, you're, I, I hate when you get spiritual on me. You know you remember. It's children. And then, and then Nike came up with what? Just do it. Just do it. If it feels good, if, if you think it's right, if, just do it. And so it's been drilled into us. Right or wrong? It's been drilled into us. Just do it. Right? It's all about you. And so at the core of a rebellious person is this self-centered attitude. You know? And here's the thing. Now pay attention here. Isaac wanted to have his way. Uh, he, 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 he wanted Esau to receive the family blessing. Now, I know that's the natural progression in the Bible, right? The eldest child, the eldest son, he, you know, the blessing is passed down upon him. I mean, he becomes the heir to the family throne, right? That's the natural progression. However, not in this case, and here's the reason why. When Isaac and Rebekah were getting ready to have these twins, God said to Isaac and Rebekah, in Genesis chapter 27, verse, uh, 25, verse 23. Go ahead and flip that up. Here, here's what God said. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and... Uh, what? The elder shall... The elder shall serve the younger. In other words, what God told Isaac and Rebekah is this, we're going to go against the grain, and in this case, I've chosen Jacob over Esau. You don't believe me? That's what God said. The elder will serve the younger, the family blessing will go upon Jacob. Jacob. Pay attention here. Isaac knew that. Isaac knew that. But now, now Isaac's up in years. His eyes are dim, right? And he knows he's getting ready to die. What does he do? Isaac wants what Isaac wants. Say this with me. I want what I want. Don't you kid yourself. You know you want what you want. If you can have it your way, you'd have it your way every time. You can have it your way. Huh? If I could have it my way, it would always be my way. I'd always have the remote. I never would watch Hallmark. I would always watch sports. <laughs> Donna would come into the room and say, put the Phillies game on, would you? If I had it my way. But I always want to have it my way. Why? That's the nature. That's the human nature. That's, the, that's at the core of human nature. Isaac says in this text of scripture, I'm going to have it my way. And so he defies the Lord. Uh, Time, he defies, he's, he's getting ready to die, and he defies the Lord. And he calls in his son, Esau, and says to him, go ahead and, and prepare, because I'm going to place the family blessing upon you. Did you see it? Wow. He's going to work to get his way using whatever means necessary. No, I, I, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. I need you to look at me. He's going to work it out so that he gets his way, whatever means necessary. 
Huh? We need to be really careful if that's our attitude. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes to have my way. Huh? And so that's the heart of a rebellious person. And here's what happens. They lose focus of the mess they're caught up in. Somebody who, who lives for themselves, someone who's self-centered, wants their way no matter what, and they'll manipulate, they'll maneuver, they'll do whatever they have to do to get their way, and, and they lose focus of the mess they're caught up in. By the way, this would be a good time to just put that message on hold and say that's true in every relationship of life. That's true if you're a church member, sometimes you want your way, and so you'll manipulate. Huh? Well, you know what? I don't like that song, or the air conditioner's a little bit too this, and, and so you'll manipulate. What do you think about that song, Brother Tyler? Did you like that song? Don't you think they do? What happened to the hymns? What happened to the worship song? What happened to... Come on now. Come on now. Huh? Why? Because you want your way. Nothing else matters. I like this style of singing. I like this style of track. God forbid, we got to wear a shirt and tie. We got to be dressed up to the nine. We got, what? That's the way I prefer it. And honestly, you're self-centered and rebellious. See, so what's that got to do with the family? I don't know, but I just like preaching that. I don't know. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All oh, right, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> Donna, what, what, what do you want me to say next? Come on, help me out here. Help me out. Here. <laughs> uh, look, look, look what happens now. So it goes from Isaac being rebellious, the father's rebellion, right? But notice what happens now. Now Rebecca jumps into the mess. Look at verse five. Look at verse five. And, and Rebecca heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son. Wait a second. You mean to tell me she's eavesdropping? You mean to tell me she was at the bedroom door? Huh? I think so. She heard it. She was listening. Listen, you don't hear what you're not listening for. Right? I'm watching the ball game. I'm in, I'm, actually, I'm watching a little bit of the Sixers game and my wife is talking. And she's saying, you, are you sure you want to drink poison? Yeah, just give me some. Put a lot of ice in it. Hurry up. I'm not paying attention. Why? I'm not listening. Right? So she heard it because she was listening for it. And look what she does. Verse 5. And Rebecca heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebecca spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, uh, before my death. And look, verse 8. Now, therefore, my son, listen to this, obey my voice. Somebody say, ouch. Obey my voice according to that which I command thee. I want you to notice this now. What you see is, is the deception of Rebecca. I put it down, go ahead and flip it, a mother's deception. A mother. So what happens is this. Pay attention right here. Uh, Rebecca gets out of her lane. Can I, can I share this with you? Life is best served for you and me when you stay in your lane. When you just stay in your lane, huh? When, when you run the race that God has set before you, when you stay on that path, that's when life usually always works best. Because when you get out of your lane, you usually create a mess. And that's what happens in this text of Scripture. So she's eavesdropping, and now she calls her younger son Jacob in, and she cooks up a plan. Right, she cooks up a plan, and, and, and you can, let's just read a little bit. Uh, we're going to finish on this point. I won't go to the third. He says, she says to him, go to the flock, fetch me a couple of, of, uh, of goats. I'm going to make some, some of that savory meat. Uh, verse number 10, then you can bring it into your father that he may eat. Are you with me? And Jacob said, look at verse 11. Jacob says to his mother, uh, behold, Esau, my brother, he's hairy, and I'm smooth. Verse 12, my father peradventure will feel me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver and it shall bring a curse upon me. Did you see, did you see that? Isaac, uh, Jacob is all upset, not because it's foundationally wrong to deceive his father. He's upset because he's afraid he might get caught. 
Hello? That's never a good reason. I don't want to deceive my dad because it's wrong to deceive my dad. Not because I'm afraid he's going to find out and I won't get the blessing. But isn't that where we live most of the time? Help me here. <laughs> Rebecca, in verse number 8, kind of shows her role as a leader. And you see the underlying evidence of dysfunction here. She has no problem. Look here. She has no problem deceiving her husband. You know how many times in my pastorate, I've had a school administrator or a youth pastor come into my office and say, Preacher, we got a problem with one of these young people in our school, one of these young people in our, our youth group. And um, what do I do? And I'd say, call, call dad. And mom would answer the phone. And youth pastor, school administrator say, excuse me, Mrs. Mrs. Genizzi, but we have a problem with, 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 with one of your, your, your girls here and we need to speak to Mr. Genizzi. And Mrs. Genizzi would say, that's okay, you can tell me. He's busy. Now, if, if I were on the phone, I'd say, no, I can't tell you. I need, to, I need to talk to your husband. But a lot of times our school administrator would say, okay, well, we need, to have you, we need to have you guys come in and visit with us. And guess who would show up? Mom. You don't have to believe this. It's okay. But I've sat across the desk many times with just mom. And I would say, where's dad? Dad can't make it. And I would say, well, dad needs to know this. And here's what she would say. No, he doesn't. He doesn't need to know it. He, he doesn't need to know. And there were times when it was serious enough when I would say, no matter what you think, he's going to know because I'm going to tell him. Huh? But then there were those times when my youth pastor, my school minister would deal just with mom and dad would never find out. And guess what happened? The debacle, the problem got worse. And then when dad got involved, dad would say, why did you tell me? And I would look over and say, ask Mrs. Genizzi. I don't know I mean, if it was our problem, <laughs> right? Ask your wife. It was your wife that hid it from you. And that proves that there's dysfunction in that home if your wife would be willing to deceive her own husband. Now, I promise you, listen, there's been times down through the years, we have four children, there's been times down through the years, my daughters or my son went to Don about something and she never came to me because she just felt, ah, he doesn't need to know that. Not important. You know, she doesn't fill my ears with every little, you know, I used to hate this. When I used to get in trouble when I was a kid, my mother used to say, you wait till your father gets home. And I said, well, why do you got to tell him? Huh? Just punish me. Go ahead and beat the snot out of me now. Don't, don't tell him. But honestly, in my case, if you knew my mother, it would be better for my father to spank me. My mother was vicious. I mean, to tell you, she was a strong Italian woman. I remember hooking in school one day, Brother Tyler. Me and my friends, we went, went to school, walked home for lunch. My friend said, hey, let's not go back. Hey, that sounds good. Well, let's have lunch. Let's do it. We're in my house. I got some, let's have some burgers. I'm in the, I'm in the kitchen, uh, Dr. Riddell. I got the cast iron skillet on the stove. I'm frying up some burgers. We're cooking in school. Let's make a deal. One o'clock we're watching. Let's make a deal. Remember those days, old people? Just come on one o'clock in the afternoon. And, and all of a sudden back door opens. Here comes mom. You don't have to believe this. I promise you it's true. She took the frying pan, dumped the burgers in the kitchen sink, and hit me in the head with the frying pan. And then she took me and my two friends right back to school where I got beat up by the nuns. And I thought, I'm never hooking in school again. <laughs> it's not worth it. Huh? She didn't have to tell my dad that day. She cleaned my clock. But when a wife, when a mother has no problem deceiving the husband or the father. There's something wrong. It just proves they're not on the same page. Hello? Are you with me? And so this is certainly the sign of, of, a, of a dysfunctional family. The father rebelling against God, the mother working to deceive her husband, and children pulled into the mess. You know what I'd say? This family needs a therapist. This family needs some help. They need some counseling. Now, I can't go any further. Time is up. 
the best part of the message is the next part. Because what you see then throw it up is the demise of a family. And you'll see what happens here. But I want to have to do this. We're going to have to put this on hold. And I promise you, we'll, we'll regather it next Sunday. Okay? Would you promise to come back? Where are you at? Every, hands up. I want your hand up. I'm coming back next Sunday. I don't care if I have to cancel whatever. I'm coming back. Lord, do you see these hands? Coming back. But let's do this. You know what a hashtag is? All right, let's hashtag this. So what, what, what do we take from it? Here's, here, here's a couple hashtags. You ready? Hashtag, hashtag um, trust. Trust. And Dad wasn't trusting God. And Mom wasn't trusting God. Uh, hashtag wait. Wait. God had promised... God had promised that Jacob was going to be the heir apparent. All Rebecca had to do was what? Wait, wait. Just wait. Hashtag listen. Listen. Just listen to the word of God. Hashtag obey. Just obey God's word. It always, go be- it always, it always goes better when we obey. Amen. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. Hashtag. So what do we take from it? I wish I could give you the whole message this morning, but it would take me another maybe 20 minutes, and I don't want to infringe upon your afternoon. But I promise you this. There's victory in Jesus. And you can have a biblical family if that's what you want. We'll give you the tools. We'll teach you how to do that. Weeks to come. But you've got to begin right where you're at, admitting areas of family life that might be out of sorts might be out of sorts you know maybe maybe there's just a little bit too much self-centeredness in your home kids are self-centered mom's self-centered dad's self-centered everybody's self-centered it's all about me all about me all about me right that's the case you know it's dysfunctional right let's pray together we'll pick this up again next week i want this series of messages to be a a blessing to our church and to our families and it can be it will be if we allow it to be our heads are bowed our hearts are lifted up before the lord maybe this morning you're here with your husband with your wife with your children just right now in your heart you're going to make up your mind to have a biblical family we certainly do not want to be labeled as anything other want to be a biblical family, a healthy family, a growing family, a God-fearing family, God-serving family, church-going family. I don't want to be dysfunctional. I don't want to get out of my lane. I don't want everything to be about me. I don't want to lose God's blessing. I want to be under the fountainhead of God's blessing. Our heads are bowed. No one's looking about, I promise now. Just, Just me, just between you and God. I wonder how many of us would say, Lord, I want to be the very best at what you want me to be. I want to be the very best at what you want me to be. Would you raise your hand nice and high? I want to be, whether it's a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, a servant, I want to be the very best at what you want me to be. Teenager, young person, I want to be the very best. I don't want, I don't want to be self-centered. I don't want to be self-centered. You can put your hands down. God bless you. I don't want to be self-centered. I want to be God-centered. I want to care about others. I want to do right. And maybe this morning you want to grab a hold of your family and just come on down to the old-fashioned altar, we call it. Have some prayer. Just pray. God, thank you for blessing our family. Thank you for allowing us to be under the preaching of your word and help us to continue to grow as a family, as, as, as a family should. And one final thing, if you're here this morning and you're not sure of Christ being your personal Savior, we invite you to come that we might take a Bible and show you, just show you, just take a few minutes, show you in the Bible what Jesus Christ has done for you. How much he loves you, died on the cross for you, wants to give you eternal life, everlasting life. Maybe today you'll come. Father, bless your people. Thank you for your word, the examples that you share. And I would pray that you'll help us to learn from them. Help us to use these as models of what to do and what not to do when it comes to life, life in Christ, family life, life in the home so that we might be right with you. We desire to be the very best that we can be for you. Bless your people this morning, we pray in Jesus' name.
and amen. Let's stand together. Carrie, if you'll begin to play. I want to ask you to bow your head so there's some privacy. Maybe this morning you just want to come, find a little spot here front and have some prayer. Maybe grab your son, your daughter, your family. Come pray. Come pray together. Well, what this world needs is families that will stick together, stay together, grow in the Lord, be consistent, be all that God wants us to be. Would you come this morning? If you need to be saved, we invite you to come this morning. Take the Bible. We'll show you what the gospel teaches. Yes, indeed. to be seated just for a moment. I want to remind you of our 930 Connect classes. And uh, just today we began the classes, I think most classes began uh, with a brand new series of studies. And so there's a class for you. Thank you, Brother Tyler. There's a, there's a, a, a flyer out uh, at the welcome desk that kind of outlines uh, each of the classes and what's being taught. And so nothing like, of course, studying through the Word of God and in small group, and so at 9.30 every Sunday morning, small group, and uh, classes just do a great job, and there's always great fellowship there, so I want to encourage you to participate in that. Tonight, we're going to have uh, a service in the auditorium tonight, not, not in the uh, Connect building, we'll be in here, one big service, um, and we'll talk to you tonight about this thing called out outreach ownership. I want, you to, I want you to understand it, comprehend it, I want to challenge us as a church to own outreach. Right? We need to reach our community with the gospel of Christ. We call it Take It to Town. And so I'm going to talk about that tonight in the evening service. Five o'clock, we'll be right here in the auditorium. All the classes right here, except for nursery. We, we love for the nursery to have their own service tonight. <laughs> Amen? So it doesn't affect us. Praise the Lord. And then uh, on your way out the door this morning, out in, in the main lobby, you'll find a money wall. We love our teenagers, and we love our, our, our families, and we want to be a blessing to them. We want all our kids to be able to go to camp. If they want to go to camp... However, it's a little costly, and so we, we try to raise money as a church, try to help out a little bit. And so uh, I'm going to ask Isaac uh, Zeller, our youth director, to come explain Money Wall, and then Brother Tyler, you come and close. Thank you, Isaac. All right. Well, it's kind of crazy. Summer camp is literally just two months away. Um, we're excited to get to take the teens there. Um, me and my wife get to take them. We can't wait to see what God does in the lives of our teens. But it's costly, like Pastor said. It costs about $378 to send a kid to camp, and that doesn't include the travel and the sponsors. So that's where we need your help. If you could take an envelope off the money wall, if you take the $20, the $20 envelope, take that, put the money, and then return it to the Welcome Center or give it to myself, and we can help take that and cover some of the costs for camp. And that's a great opportunity for you to invest in the future generations of this church because I know God's going to do a great work at camp and just be able to see these kids grow in the Lord. So with that, I'll give it to Brother Tyler. Hey, uh, let me just say this too about so whatever number you take is the number, the money you're going to give, right? So if you wanted to give a hundred, if that hundred dollar envelope is gone, because I know so many of you wanted that envelope, you know, you can take, you can take things that'll measure up to that. You can take two, you can take a 50, you know, 25, a 20 and a five, right? And still make up that hundred, right? And I think if we, if we, if we got everything off the money wall, it'll come to how much? $5,000. $5, Right? And so by you and I just doing that small part, we'll, we'll raise $5,000. Isn't that wonderful? And that'll really help to offset the cost so these families don't have to pay for transportation, you know, and, and sponsors and things of that nature, right? Hey, ushers, go ahead and take the offering. Go ahead, Brother Tyler. All right, as ushers take the offering, 
I just want to encourage you to be back this evening and look forward to a service tonight with our pastor here right in this auditorium. Uh, Once again, be reminded of that. As you uh, make your way out, you'll see a couple things that you can uh, take from the foyer. And we have invite cards that are in containers that are on the wall. Clear the containers. It's fine. We'll restock. And we want you to take those and do that if you would. There's also some invite cards on a table underneath the map. And that'll kind of get you started with the idea of what uh, Pastor will be talking to us tonight about. And so I want you to take those invite cards as well, some John and Romans, just different uh, tools and opportunities that you can have something in your hand to be able to hand to somebody else in our community because our community needs it. And God allowed you to have the gospel be brought to you. Let's share the gospel with someone else. And we can do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we can be able to be underneath your word. Thank you for what we learned this morning. Thank you for the family that we can have, and Lord, the families that you've allowed us to have. I thank you for the family of God, and Lord, I pray this morning that we will do our part to follow through with what we've heard and what we've received, to trust, to wait, to listen, to obey. Show us areas where we're self-centered, and help us to correct those, those spots, and Lord, be clean and right before you. We thank you for it. Bring us back tonight. Give us safety as we travel now. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.